Welcome, welcome on this Labor Day weekend. I think that we will pick up sort of where we left off last Sunday. Want to continue uh, contemplating the mystery of gender in terms of the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. And I want to contemplate the beginning of the end, the end, let's say, in the way of the world, on the one hand, and on the other, in the way of the church. Now, does it surprise you, would it surprise you, if I were to claim, assert, that the way the world understands and thinks about reality is rooted in mythology. Would not surprise you. Yeah, because you talked about that before. So. Oh. <laughs> Over all the years. The only thing I would amend that is say I think the Western world. Nope. Oh, the whole world. The whole world. The, West, the Western world, too. Um, and the church, of course, understands the beginning and the end uh, and uh, reality in terms of theology. Um, I said rooted in mythology because historically, as far as I can make out, you have mythology, gives birth to philosophy, gives birth to the, to the sciences, and even to history. Now that kind of caught me by surprise. So that even the, uh, even the discipline of history, which, wants just, which just, just wants to record, uh, supposedly, uh, apparently, uh, just the just the facts, ma'am. Um, even that is rooted in mythology. Oh, there he is. Um, and the reason, but what 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 is compelling to me about this discovery that I came to a couple weeks ago. Um, it's my discovery, so you're free to do with it what you want. You can, you can just you can dismiss it, or you can, um, you can think about it and, and, and chew on it. What, what's compelling to me about it is that um, it explains so much. Um, so, to speak in biblical terms. Uh, and I'm still going to be sounding like some kind of a, I don't know, uh, whatever, a, a strange, a strange person. I'm going to sound like a strange person, uh, but but I'm, I don't think it's so strange. So speaking biblically, that means that the knowledge of the world, um, all knowledge, philosophical, scientific. Um, historical and anything you want to mention scientific even even scientific it is all traced back biblically to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil it goes no further than that and when I read the myths and I'm not a specialist on mythology at all um, but uh, so, so uh, you know, I have to qualify. You, you have to qualify what you hear from me. This is from a sophomore, which means that I have just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Um, when I, as I contemplate the myths and read the myths, it's so striking to me. Um, all of them, all of them um, are uh, articulating um, you know, I mean, you can see, you can see at the bottom of all of these myths from all over the world, 
um, you can see the image of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I just find I, that, that, that's very compelling to me. Because um, what it means is that, um, you know, Adam and Eve, you remember there was the Edenic mountain, um, and that midway up the Edenic mountain was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's trees and, and its branches and boughs spread out so that Adam and Eve could not see farther up the mountain. That's all they could see. And so Adam and Eve got to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate of that tree. They chose not to go up on, on up higher. They chose to eat from that tree, and that's as high as they went, and then they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. They went out into the world. So to me, it just makes all kinds of sense. All kinds of sense. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about yet. Um, but um, maybe we'll understand it more as we proceed a bit more. So uh, I'm going to give you this um, handout, which will illustrate what I'm talking about. And um, I'm going to hand those out, please. And Martin, hand those out. Um, it'll illustrate what I'm talking about. And uh, maybe it'll start to make sense. Um, and you'll see how there is a quite, uh, as far as I can tell, a, a, a very different vision of man as male and female um, uh, in, in Holy Scripture, in the church, theologically, as opposed to mythology. So, uh, let's see. Okay, I gave them all out, so give me back one, so I know what I'm... Okay, to, but first of all, real quick, to review. Here's, here's, here's what we're doing. We're looking at the beginning and the end of all things. We talked about, we touched on that last, last Sunday. And uh, let's, let's retrace our steps as to how we got to the beginning and the end, theologically. Uh, remember, we started with the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity uh, was given to us from the doctrine of Christ. So, confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, is what leads to the revelation of, the, of God as Holy Trinity. Um, historically, it's the doctrine of the Trinity that is articulated first in the 4th century, uh, which, pays, which opens the way for articulating next the doctrine of Christ, which uh, begins in earnest the latter half of the 4th uh, century uh, beginning of the 5th century, and you might say is completed with the 7th uh, Ecumenical Council in 787 with the, uh, venerate, with the restoration of icons um, in the church. Uh, and then, so we, so what we start with the Trinity, uh, which takes us to Christology, and this takes us to, actually, to creation, a doctrine, an understanding of creation, and of anthropology, Um, of man as male and female. Now, just to anticipate what we might be getting into later uh, in a few minutes, just look at this. Man as male and female. That's how man comes to be. Man doesn't come to be as... I mean, even, you know, even in Genesis chapter 2, when, when God creates man, Adam, uh, the myth... And mythologists would want to see here a, 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 an echo of uh, ancient, of, of universal mythological themes that Adam is in effect androgynous, male, female, and they would uh, they would um, support that on the grounds that later on God draws woman from out of Adam, but that's not a theological reading, nor is it a close reading, <laughs> because. Um, Adam is created uh, by God, and it says later on that he is alone. Uh, there's not somebody hiding in him. Um, he's alone. And when the woman is made, she's not, as it were, pulled out of Adam. Um, God takes his rib, and from his rib, she builds, he builds woman. 
So um, Adam and Eve come to, into existence as male and female. There's not an androgynous man, male, female. Male and female are each one their own concrete um, um, subject. Um, so contemplate that, uh, but so that, that, ma uh, that, that man comes into being as male and female, not as a, not as a hodgepodge, an androgynous hodgepodge, but comes into being as male, female. And then contemplate um, how the creation comes into being as heaven and earth, night and day. There's a parallel. Um, the um, seeds come into being, or that the plants come to be, um, not as a hodgepodge. Um, not as a hodgepodge. Um, they come together, God makes each seed, and as it says, each one according to its kind. Um, so, um, as we contemplate the creation as it is, you know, in, in general terms, uh, here theology and mythology seem to be going along the same road in that both of them present to us a creation as constituted of yin yang male female night day heaven earth but that's as far as they go together um, at this point mythology eats from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and stops and goes back down the mountain theology keeps climbing up to the tree of life which is christ and thereby attains a theological vision of everything all right um so um we have creation as heaven and earth night and day. And what's even more interesting to me, okay, okay, all, all this is going to come into play. So, now let's, let's bring this over here. <coughs> Creation comes into being as heaven and earth and as night and day. Now, when we want to talk about or, 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 or you know, uh, uh, talk about the creation in totality and, and, and as it were, um, you know, in, uh, encompass it in just one phrase, you, the term that we use is not is space-time. The creation is space-time. All right? I don't know, just looking at this, what do you, what we, what, this strikes me as what? This would be the space. And this would be the time. So here's the incarnation, if you will, the embodiment, the, uh, yeah, the embodiment of space. Here's the embodiment of time. So um, this, you know, so here, if you will, is the form, you know, the structure of creation, the space is what you see. Here is the inner content of creation and what we see it is that it's a movement of time. Now, what, what sense are we going to make of all of that? Well, let's look at this, first of all, from the mythological point of view, and then let's look at it from the theological point of view. I'm going to, I want to think I want to keep all that. Actually, maybe I'll redraw this. All right, let's see how this goes. Let's take a look at your handout from the Pelasgian creation myth. Um, I'm using this for a specific purpose. 
It really, it really, it really uh, jumped out at me. Let's read it. In the beginning, your enemy, your, uh, which means a broad field, a broad pasture, the goddess of all things, rose naked from chaos, but found nothing substantial for her feet to rest upon, and therefore divided the sea from the sky, dancing lonely upon its waves. She danced towards the south, and the wind set in motion behind her seemed something new and apart with which, and apart with which to begin a work of creation. Wheeling about, she caught hold of this north wind, rubbed it between her hands, and behold, the great serpent Ophion. Ophion means serpent. Your enemy danced to warm herself, wildly and more wildful, until Ophion, grown lustful, coiled about those divine limbs and was moved to couple with her. So your enemy was got with child. As I say, I'm not a mythologist, but I can, I can smell a lot of stuff here. This is packed. But even in, our, even in our sophomoric status, I think we can do something with this. Um, so we have, um, uh, we have uh, the child, I believe, that your enemy may have been, uh, been got with would have been the universal egg. Out of which everything came into being, or you know, was hatched. So we're looking at pre-world, pre-heaven and earth, as it were. And what do you see? Uh, let's ask this question: Where does the goddess of all things come from? What's first? And actually, you can look at the next two quotes below. Do you get a get a get a clue? Chaos. So, what's at the very, very, very beginning? The absolute beginning. Chaos. And we're going to put it down here because what we're after is an understanding of the hypostasis. Do you remember what hypostasis stands for? Right, what's underneath. <laughs> So what supports everything? What holds everything? What is the source? So the hypostasis is the beginning. It's the uh, source. It's the root. It's the foundation. It's the ground. It's the ground. So chaos here is what's given as the hypostasis. All right. Beyond that, I'm just going to ask you, what do you, um, uh, I'm going to make a very, very pointed question. Since we're, we're, we're dealing here with the absolute primordial beginnings, do you see a tree here? And if so, which tree, what tree do you see? So I'll answer your question for you. You do see a tree, so I'll give you that much. What tree do you see? Well, good and evil. Okay, excellent. Um, what is the image of the tree of good and evil? What, how does it present itself to us in Genesis chapter three, or yeah, Genesis chapter three? Who, who's who, who? I mean, who's there? The serpent and the tree. The tree is the goddess, your enemy here. And the serpent is her consort. I just want you to know this. Thing. This is the reason this jumped out at me. This is why I chose it. Because I think this perhaps more clearly than all of the other myths shows how the absolute beginning in the mythological understanding of man is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now I have a lot of regard. I have very high regard for mythology. I do not think it's, uh, it's, it's foolish or child's play. I think it's very real, I think it's very serious, um, as, uh, because I feel that mythology is the, uh, it's, it's just the innate, uh, spontaneous um, movement 
of the soul. And mythology gives expression to this soul's <coughs> movement. And that's why I think it all the more fascinating, compelling, uh, riveting to me, uh, to witness in all of these myths um, uh, the soul able to go back no further than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It just, you know, um, that's where the knowledge of the world starts, at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. So here we have the serpent, we have um, the goddess, we have masculine, feminine. I'm sure you can see and understand that the serpent would be an image of the male organ, and then you perhaps can understand why the tree would be an image of the goddess, the feminine. So here we have chaos, and out of chaos coming, um, how would you want to draw this? Um, well, we have the tree coming out, and its roots going down into chaos. Here's the tree, and uh, from her branches hangs the serpent. So I want you to see how in the mythological view, chaos is the hypostasis, it's the ground where everything starts from the root of all things, and I want you to see how out of chaos emerges this male-female pair, this primordial pair. Um, you can see the way I've drawn it, that it has an androgynous character to it. And in many of the myths, the original pair is, in fact, a single being, an androgynous being. So then the androgyny, the androgynous being, is just a, a, a reflection of chaos, is he not? Because in the androgynous, like chaos, is kind of an undifferentiated uh, mingling of male and female. It's like chaos... Um, how would you say, to a lesser power. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not full chaos. We're always starting to, di we're starting to come out of the indifferentiation a bit. Um, and then out of the androgyny comes the particulars. Now, let me ask you a question here, looking at this. Okay, so uh, here's the beginning. Or well, let's say that out of this, here's the beginning. So um, let's say that here's the beginning of the, from out of the uh, Eurynomy, and in this and in this myth, Ophion, um, out of their dancing and their coupling, there comes the creation with everyone else, all of the branches. So we'll say the branches and the twigs and the leaves. And we'll say that the twigs and the leaves represent each particular that you encounter in the universe, in the cosmos. So you are a leaf, you're a live. We'll say that Dan is a twig, or Gene is a twig. Um, you're a branch, you're, you know, whatever. You get the idea, okay? So now let me ask you, um, if this is the beginning, um, everything comes out. And as you see in the creation, as you see in the, uh, in the plants, uh, the plants come up out of the ground, out of the night. They come up into the day, and then they go back. And then they come up, and then they go back. Well, you're a plant, so why would you not follow the same course? You've come up out of the dark, out of the ground, out of the night. You're going to go back. Come up, you're going to go back. Who knows what you'll be the next time you come up. Um, so I want, what, what I want you to see there is how the beginning, where you started, is where you're going to go back. So that the beginning and the end 
are the same. I want, that's what I want you to see. And just as a high, just as a side light, this, by the way, is the mystery. The beginning and the end are like the gates um, through which you come into manifestation from the mystery and in death. So here's the birth. Here's death. So through birth you come out of the mystery. In death you go back into the mystery. And so here's your circle. The circle of life. Mystery, fascinatingly enough, comes from this word mu, which means to close. And the, my sources told me that it's etymology, it took me uh, etymologically uh, back as far as the fish, that the mu, that the word mu um, signifies the opening and the closing of the, of the fish's gills as it's breathing underwater opening, closing. So from this mu to close comes the word mystery, which, I mean, you know, the fish is just, just a beautiful image because the fish swims in the sea. And the sea is the mystery, which we came out of. We came out of and onto the island of, uh, of manifestation, of the light, the day. And when we die, we're going to go back into the sea. So here's the mystery. Here's where you begin. Here's where you end. Um, the mystery then, and what's in the mystery, is closed. It's closed off to you. Or let's say it's closed off to the profane eyes. You can't see into the mystery. And so the purpose of the mystery religions is to teach you and to enable you to open your eyes so that you can see into the mystery. So the Hierophant, the priest, would be called the mystagogue, which comes from ago, which means to lead. <coughs> and here's the word mu. So the mystagogue is one who leads you into that closed off area that is on the other side of the gates of your birth and your death. Uh, the mythos, here's that word again, is the story that tells you about the mystery, what's on the other side. And since what's on the other side is calm, is, is, is the origin of everything, and so it transcends what's on the island of be of existence. Then the image, the, or the, the, the mystery, is going to present itself to us on the island in images that are bizarre, um, um, not, not, not necessarily sequential or coherent. And so um, the, the job of the, uh, of the seer, the seer, <coughs> is to see into the images, these bizarre, crazy, wild images that come at us in dreams, uh, in the myths of the peoples, of the, of the peoples of the world, and to interpret them, to tell you what they're talking about. So as you look at this, I mean, it's fascinating, is it not? I, 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 I'm quite taken by it. But I want you to look at this, and you tell me, okay. So the beginning of everything is ultimately chaos, undifferentiated unity. Everything's jumbled in a, in a primordial hodgepodge soup. So if that's the beginning, where you're going to go down, back down to, all right, what are you? What are you in your absolute irreducible... All creation is an expression of chaos. Exactly. So then, male, female, um, What's their ultimate end as their, also their ultimate beginning? What is it? You go back to look at the quote from Ovid here. It's all back to um, a fusion discordant atom, war, atoms of war. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, male? Shapelessness. Okay. 
So, oh, no. Uh, Ovid is using the term atom, which obviously does not mean what it means for us today, but at the sa- it, it does mean the same. It means little tiny particulars. And isn't that the world, I mean, isn't that the view of science today? How is, how is the view of science any different from this? You, know, you even have chaos theory now. Uh, on, you know, in, in, in function, in form, how is the scientific vision of the world any different from this? Only instead of, instead of, uh, instead of the Gia, the goddess Gia, you have Earth, which is what Gia means. Instead of the god Uranus, Uranus, you have the heavens or the sky, which is what Uranus means. Instead of the god Kronos, you have time, which is what Kronos means. All science does, if you will, is it, it uh, depersonalizes these natural forces and uh, demythologizes them accordingly, uh, apparently, and, and, and it just translates the, the, the original language into English or to French, German or whatever. Uh, demythologizing it while keeping the myth. <laughs> well, so this is what I want you to see. That mythologically speaking, or uh, understood mythologically, when we, uh, understanding the world mythologically, um, we're going higher, we're going back and no further than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where the god is the serpent, Lucifer, and the goddess, Um, is the wisdom of the human soul um, that is intoxicated, let's say, by the venom of the serpent. You could describe it in many different other ways. But let's just, just, just to, just to make the point, we'll, we'll describe it like that. So if you're ever reading, you know, from a myth or from, uh, uh, from a mythologist, Joseph Campbell, Mirchi Iliadi, um, uh, if you're reading Carl Jung, um, just be looking for that. Um, now I said that mythology, I suggested that mythology is, is, uh, is the expression of the soul's natural movements. Um, I would go further and say then that mythology is the, is the, uh, the woeful song of the soul who's caught in the branches of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the mournful song of the fallen soul looking for her lover and she can't find him because she's caught, she's caught, she's darkened, her eyes have been, her eyes have been opened to see that she's naked to see that she's been stripped of the garment of her lover. Um, so there is, so it, it stands to reason that if the mytholo- if mythology is the expression of the soul, uh, that it's going to, that mythology is going to have, uh, in, in many of its, in, in all of its forms, it is going to look like theology. Or we can say it like this. If theology is the proclamation of the tree of life coming down into the branches of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and clothing himself with those, with those leaves, you know, with our flesh, then you could say that theology is, um, it looks like, it looks, it has the form of mythology precisely because the one who thought it not robbery to be equal with God nonetheless emptied himself and took the form of a servant. Theology took the form of mythology in order to die and become absolutely one with us in order to deliver us from the branches of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, um, okay, was there something else I was on? So, um, let's now then, let, let's go to, I thought there was something else I was wanting to, to, to say with that. It, it may come back to me, and if it does, I'll, I'll bring it back. So now let's go back 
And let's look at this theologically. I'm going to redraw this. I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. Let's go to Genesis. Or even let's go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is basically a commentary on Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. And uh, let's see what we, what we read. In the beginning, in the beginning was the Logos. Now first of all, okay, the beginning. Well, what's the beginning? It doesn't tell us what the beginning is any more than it tells us what the beginning was in Genesis chapter 1. However, I think that we can de um, um, deduce from many other sources, put them all together, and we can say that the beginning actually is multivalent. It has many different layers. The beginning is chock full. But um, I think one, we can, one way that we could say is that the beginning is the bosom of the Father. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word. So that would mean, who would that be? <laughs> it would be the bosom of the Father. And in the Greek, the Word was with the Father. Tontheon, and there's a definite article there that tells us we're talking to the Father. The word was with the Father. So here we have, in the beginning, we do not have chaos, nor do we have, um, you know, your enemy um, coming out of this undifferentiated. We have, a very, we have a very differentiated unity. It's a very differentiated unity. It's the Father who is not mingled with the Son. It is the Father with the Son, the Son with the Father. Um, in the Holy Spirit. We don't, the, the Holy Spirit is not given explicitly in John chapter 1, nor for that matter, well, he's given more explicitly in Genesis, but the Holy Spirit is in John chapter 1 here. He's the life. In him was life. That's the Holy Spirit. Um, so here we have as our beginning, we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, not one God in an undifferentiated chaotic unity, but one God in a um, undivided division. As I'm, I'm quoting now from Saint Gregory Palamas, in a in a in a divisible um, undivision. How does he say it? Dividedly undivided, undiv dividedly undivided and um, um, undividedly divided. <laughs> um, so a very, differentiated unit, a very differentiated unity in which we have three persons, <clears throat> um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Moreover, moreover, they do not come, their source is not some essence, divine essence, which stands underneath them from which the three proceed. Can you see, if that was the case, we'd just be back into pagan mythology. Theology would have, our theology, quote unquote, would have just collapsed right back into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who's at the bottom? Absolutely, who at the absolute bottom? Who is at the bottom? Who's the source of it all? The Father. The hypostasis of the Father, which stand, the, the hypostasis that stands underneath. The Father is the cause of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because the Son is begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Already, we're in a different... You can feel yourself climbing the mountain now. I mean, to me, suddenly the air feels fresh. <laughs> um, because if the absolute beginning, the absolute, absolute beginning is the Father and not some blob, some energetic force. What's going to be the character of reality? 
Is it going to be at its irreducible essence? Is it going to be undifferentiation, effort, undifferentiated chaos? Are you following me? Or is it going to have the character of its beginning? Well, of course, it's going to have the character of its beginning. So if its beginning is the differentiated hypostasis of the Father, that means that all of reality, uncreated reality and created reality that comes from it, is going to be, let's say, hypostatic, personal, differentiated. Um, you look at it further. So you have the Son. It says, he is the icon of the Father. He's the image of the Father. Colossians 1.15. The Holy Spirit is in the Son. And so, um, here's how I would presume to draw <laughs> uh, the creation. Um, the Father speaks his son is the word that he speaks, the dabar, the logos. You know, the dabar in Hebrew, the dabar, or what stands at the very back of the sanctuary, what's at the very source of everything. So he speaks. And the world, how are you going to draw this? The world, let's do it this way. So let's draw the sun like this. Let's draw a circle for the sun like this. Let's put the uh, divine essence right here just to show that the essence exists in the Father and in the Son. It's not like part of the essence is in the Father and part of the essence is, the, is in the Son. This part we can't draw. The whole essence is in the Son. The whole essence is in the Father. The whole essence is in the Holy Spirit. And let's draw the Son's hypostasis like this. And then let's take the Holy Spirit. Let's draw him like this. Um, let's take, okay, so let's take um, even, uh, let's, let me do redo this. Let's take the sun's hypostasis and let's do this. And let's draw the sun all the way like this. You'll see that I have the Holy Spirit outside the sun, because I want to show how the Holy Spirit carries the sun. Wherever the sun goes, there the Holy Spirit goes. That's what I want to, what I want to show. And then out of, out of them, I don't know how you could do this, the world comes to be. It comes to be. Now, if I were a mythologist, I would draw it like this. But I couldn't because it's already not making sense. It already become incoherent. I might draw it like this. The world comes into being as male and female. But I can't draw it like that. Because male and female are of the nature. They're of our nature. They're not, they don't exhaust the content of the hypostasis of the person. Did you follow me? I kind of just kind of jumped tracks here. But if the creation is going to mirror, if it's going to have the quality of the hypostatic character of the Holy Trinity and of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, then the creation is going to be hypostatic, which is to say that the male and the female um, parts of the creation are hypostatic. That is to say, the male and female gender would be the, the prosopon, the face. In Latin, it would be persona. This is where we get the word person from. This is why in the, in the Orthodox Church we prefer hypostasis to talk about the person. Because person is just, just the face. It doesn't tell you what's underneath. We want to tell you what's underneath. <laughs> it's you. You're not just a face, a mask that's going to be dissolved, uh, taken away, then what's inside of you is just going to be dissolved. 
So masculine, feminine are, as it were, the prosopon, they're the face, the embodiment of the hypostatic character of creation. And man and woman are created um, as, so here you have the creation, which is heaven and earth, night and day, male, female, yin, yang, da 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 But it is not, it does not exhaust the creation because the creation reaches its climax when God creates Adam and Eve. He creates Adam and Eve as male, female. within the creation. But, remember, Adam is taken from the earth, so in that way he's part of the creation, but he has another source. How else does it, what, what, what is it, you know, where does he come from so that he becomes a living soul? The whole, the Holy Spirit. Yes, the breath of, the breath of life. So that he has two sources. Two origins, if you will. Well, even the earth has its origin in the, in the mystery of the Holy Trinity. But he doesn't just come from the earth, heaven and earth, night and day. He comes from the hypostatic mystery of the Holy Trinity. So there is something about man, if you will, that is, that, um, you're losing me, I'm sure. This image is getting too, too complicated, too messy. There's something about him that, that transcends his male gender, his male-female you know, gender, that transcends his nature, transcends the earth he's made from, transcends the dual character of the earth that he's taken from. There's something that transcends that. It's his having been created in the image of God, who is the hypostasis of Christ, who is the image of the hypostasis of the Father, in the hypostasis of the Holy Spirit. So that we are created in the image of the hypostases of the Holy Trinity. Which is to say that our, as Origin of Alexandria said it, our primary essence, our primary substance, he uses the word hypostasis. Because in his day, hypostasis didn't mean what it's going to mean a century two or two later. Our primary hypostasis is our having been made in the image of God. Which is, sim which is another way of saying our primary essence, our primary character is our having been made as hypostases. That is to say, like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember we were talking about the character of the hypostasis, how the hypostasis in the Holy Trinity shows itself in movement. The Father is the lover of the Son and the beloved of the Son. The Son is the beloved of the Father and the loved of the Father, the lover of the Father, and so forth and so on. So that the hypostasis by its very, in, in its very identity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in its very identity, it is in movement. And that movement is the movement of loving and being loved, receiving the other and being received by the other. This is the character of the hypostasis. We're not just closed in entities in an, on ourselves, nor am I just a, uh, you know, a, a a, a, a kaleidoscopic configuration of a mound of earth next to your kaleidoscopic configuration so that if, you know, the shell that is holding us together dissolves, this kaleidoscopic arrangement of dirt just kind of like that, and I am no more, I just, you know, rather I'm this hypostatic, that what's, what's underneath my earth is the hypostasis, which, you know, merges into the other, but is never lost into the other, never dissolves into the other. And there's this, so there's this movement, and it's this circular movement of being received and receiving. I kind of draw it like this. This is, so, this is what it means to say that we're created in the, in the image of God. We're created in movement. We're created in erotic movement, giving ourselves to the other, receiving the other into ourselves. So that this means that this, this is what underneath, this is what stands underneath your male and female gender. This is what I mean then when I say that gender is the gate of life or death. It depends, it, 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 it hinges on what you choose to do with your gender as to what, you know, whether it's going to be the gate to life or the gate to death. 
Because if you are primarily hypostatic, I mean, that is to say, if you're, you know, in our, word, in our language, if you're primarily a person underneath your nature, that means that you're primarily a lover. Or let's say it this way, you're primarily a beloved, longing to love. Um, so that, um, um, let's see here, so, okay, so, so th this is what's underneath you, then, okay, then, the only way you're going to attain, achieve, or you know, realize this, 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 this uh, hypostatic quality in you, which is to love and to be loved, is by the choice you make. You can't be forced to love. You cannot be forced to obey God, your lover. You have to choose to love God in order for this hypostatic quality of yours to burst into flame, if you will. So that is the whole point of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God warned them, don't you eat from that tree, but he did not prevent it. It was critical that he allow them the freedom to exercise their choice. Am I going to, be, am I going to choose to be bound by nature, by gender, and fall back into the world that, of mythology, you know, that, who, whose limits are bounded by male, female, night, sky, uh, heaven, earth, da 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 Or am I going to deny that in order to transcend and keep making my way up to the mountain, up the mountain, up to the tree of life, and attain to hypostatic communion, up here where there is neither male nor female, that is to say, where everyone is realizing their hypostatic character as receiver, received, lover, beloved. Um, So, that's the biblical vision. This is the theological vision of man as male and female. Um, okay, I kind of need to wrap it up here. So, so any questions? Uh, you feel like... I have yes. an interesting question. Which is worse? Paganism or atheism? I think if the atheist would uh, get intelligent and just think through his atheism, he'd discover he's falling right back into mythology. Yeah, but I would say atheism is worse because at least classical paganism at least has a sense of the sacred. Yeah, I think I think you're yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, it acknowledges the sacred. The atheism is like a like a, a suicidal blindness. Well, I think what we have in our culture today is a neo paganism. What we have in our culture today, you could see, whatever you want to call it, um, it's our culture is is you can see the myth moving in our culture. Males wanting to become females, males wanting to copulate with males. Da, 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 da. That's all an effort. You know, that's all the mythological movement trying to get back to the undifferentiated chaos. Because the idea is that if I, you know, the, it, the, by getting back to the end, everything is made new. You start all over again. So that means that all of my all of my failings, all of my sufferings, all of my sorrows, they're washed away in the chaotic, undifferentiated unity, and I can start up again. Maybe things will be different the next round. So you can see the mythology even in today's culture and all of the madness of today's culture. Where the, the culture today is going back to chaos. The mythology. All right. Shall we go upstairs?